So my subject is strong privacy and reputational enforcement. And I want to start by saying a little bit about the technology. Uh, not very much. I assume many of you are familiar with it and some of you are not. But the underlying technology is public key encryption. And that is a mathematical process that produces a pair of keys, each a long number, such that what one key scrambles, the other key is needed to descramble. So if I scramble a message with key A, key A will not descramble it, but key B will, and the same thing in the other direction. Uh, what I then do is to make one of the keys public, so-called public key, and keep the other very private. Now, if you want to send me a message, you encrypt it with my public key, which everybody knows. Other people with my public key still can't read it. They can only send me messages too. I decrypt it with my private key. If I want to prove a message is from me, I encrypt it with my private key. You decrypt it with my public key. And the fact that what you get is not gibberish proves that it was encrypted with the matching private key, therefore that it must be from me. And part of what's important about that is that that not only proves to you that I sent the message, it proves it in a way I can't disown, that you can prove to any interested third party that I actually sent that message because you have a message encrypted with my private key, which only I have. That's the basic logic of, this, of digital signatures. In practice, there are lots of more complicated things, but that's the guts of what it is and of public key encryption for privacy. Then the next question is, how in this system do I make payments? Because to have a functioning economy, I have to have a way of paying people money. And the answer is that I use an anonymous digital cash. A version of that was thought up by a Dutch cryptographer, David Chaum, decades ago. Uh, the newer version is cryptocurrency. Uh, each of them has problems. And if there's time, I will discuss that a little bit at the end. What does the resulting world look like? It's on an online world where messages are entirely private. Anybody can send a message to anybody that no one else can read. Where we have digital signatures so that I can prove who I am online without having to reveal any information about my real space identity. Anonymous digital cash of one form or another for payments. And what's interesting, it is now possible to have both anonymity and reputation. I can have reputation for my online identity without having to tell anyone what my, uh, how old I am, whether I'm male or female, or what continent I live on. Very interesting combination. Uh, and I've discussed this uh, 24 years ago in an article, which you can find on my webpage. Uh, here it is. Uh, and uh, the the web yeah the the web page uh, is daviddfriedman.com, which is pretty easy to remember. There are advantages and disadvantages of this technology, like most technologies. One of the advantage is that although it is still possible to commit fraud online, it's not really possible to commit force. What we think of as force online, hacking into computers, is ultimately a form of fraud. It involves persuading your computer that this is somebody it's supposed to trust when it isn't. But you can't get a bullet through a T1 line. So literal force is not an option in the online world, although, of course, it still is in the uh, real space world. On the other hand, this also means that you cannot use force to enforce contracts so that the court system the ordinary court system in effect vanishes. You can't sue somebody if you do not know anything about him. Uh, so you therefore need a different way of enforcing agreements in order to have a functioning economy online. And the way to do it, I think, the way I'll be discussing today is through reputation. Reputational enforcement is a very interesting way of enforcing things, and it has certain problems of its own. Imagine that I buy a suit uh, the seller says money back if you don't like it. I bring it home and my wife points out that I'm not really a 40 uh, tall, but a 36 short and that purple is not my color. I take it back. And in fact, they give me my money back. And the question is, why do they give me my money back? 
they know that for a sum this small, I am not in fact going to sue them. However, they also know that if they don't give me my money back, not only will I not buy from them again, but I will tell other people that they cannot be trusted and they will lose other customers. Uh, and that is a reason why they want to maintain their reputation. The odd thing about this is that enforcement here is a byproduct. Most goods and services we get are produced for their own sake. If it's worth producing to me and costs less than what it's worth to me to you, you will produce it and make money selling it to, you, to me. Enforcement does not work that way, perhaps unfortunately, because the other people who choose not to buy from the department store are not trying to punish the store. They're not trying to enforce my contract. They are merely people who want themselves not to be cheated, that they want, therefore they're acting for their own benefit, not for the purpose of enforcing the contract. Enforcing the contract is as it were a side effect. Why is this a problem? Suppose that we have a contract, you break it, I tell everybody what you did, and you, of course, deny it. You claim that I'm the one who didn't fulfill my terms of the contract. Consider the situation from the standpoint of a third party who has no way of knowing which of us is lying. His rational response is, one of the two is dishonest. I'd rather not deal with dishonest people. There are lots of honest people out there in the world. Therefore, I should trust neither of the two parties sensible thing for him to do, but a very poor way of punishing breach, because now recognizing that I don't report the breach because it'll only hurt me to do so. So what that tells us is that in reputational enforcement breaks down if the interested third parties cannot easily uh, determine who is at fault. That's the problem we have to solve to make it work as a substitute for a court system online. How do we arrange that online? You and I agree to a contract. We digitally sign the contract. That means that each of us has a signed copy, which he can show to anybody else to prove the other one signed it. And the contract includes the virtual identity of the arbitrator who we agree to judge the contract and his public key, which is his critical identifier. You break the contract. I ask for arbitration, and the arbitrator concludes that you are indeed at fault and owes me $10,000. You pay or you don't pay. If you don't pay, the arbitrator writes up his verdict, the fact of your default, that you did not pay according to his ruling, signs it using his private key and gives me a copy. I now have the original contract, which you provably signed, the arbitrator's verdict, signed by the person who you agreed would arbitrate the dispute. I post that online uh, on the web or whatever the future equivalent of the web is with tags identifying you, uh, your public key, the name you do business online under, whatever else of that sort is useful to find you. Anybody else who is thinking of doing business with you does a web search for information about you he finds what I have posted, and at the cost of a few seconds of computer time checking the signatures, he discovers that you signed a contract, agreed to an arbitrator in advance, and then refused to abide by that arbitrator's verdict. He now knows with a reasonable degree of confidence that you are the one who cheated, that it is therefore in his interest not to do business with you, but no reason not to do business with me, you have now been punished with a loss of reputation, which makes it in your interest to keep your contracts. One problem solved. However, there are still problems remaining. What if you want to do business with me, but you have no reputation that it would be costly for you to lose? So I have no reason to trust you. And there are three different solutions to that problem. One of them is if one of us has a reputation, we set up the contract so that only that one has to be trusted. If the seller has a reputation, the buyer pays in advance. The seller could collect the money and not deliver, but that would cost him his reputation. If the buyer has a reputation, the seller delivers and then the buyer pays. And in fact, 
This is a familiar way we do things in real space. I pay Amazon in advance. They don't have the reputation of not delivering the goods for obvious reasons. You can generalize this approach to more complicated transactions in which each party performs different parts of the contract over time. Uh, you are building a house for me. I make payments along the way, but you want to structure the contract so that only one of us has an opportunity to gain by breaching the contract. And that's the one who has a reputation at risk and therefore won't. All right? So that's one solution that you structure the contract to put the risk of breach on the party who can be trusted not to do it. What if neither of you has a reputation? Then you grant a reputation from a third party, possibly the arbitrator. When you sign the contract, each of you deposits $10,000 in digital cash with the arbitrator. And if he just finds that I breached, my money forfeits to you. Of course, the arbitrator could just steal the money from both of us, pocket 20,000 and go home, but he would then lose his reputation because he of course has a contract with us, which he's digitally signed, agreeing to do this. And the reason we chose that arbitrator was that he has a reputation that makes it not in his interest to steal $20,000 at the cost of a $100,000 reputation. The real world equivalent of this is an escrow agent, which eBay, for example, uses if you're buying something where you have to inspect it before you, you accept it. It goes to the escrow agent, you inspect the product, you then pay the money and the escrow agent gives the goods to you. Third possibility is to buy a reputation. I want to go in business online and have no reputation. So I do something online that is visible and expensive and that is linked to my virtual identity. For example, I give $50,000 to a popular online charity or I run an expensive online advertising campaign. Now, if, if I contract with you and break the contract, then the expensive reputation I have bought vanishes and so I won't do that. Arguably, this is one reason why in real space, companies conduct such ad campaigns. Part of the reason is that having spent a lot of money on the ad campaign, people know that they are not planning to just take your money and run because that will then burn up the reputation they have bought uh, with the ad campaign. Uh, and as Classical example of this is that in the 19th century, when banks in the US were issuing their own money, the so-called wildcat banking period, the banks had expensive buildings suitable only for banks with fancy marble facings. They weren't worth building if you were planning to get people to deposit money and then steal it and head out of town. So the fact that you had made the investment in that building was evidence you were going to stay around. Once I've bought a reputation, future honest transactions build it. The longer I've been in business online, the more valuable my reputation to me, hence the more people are willing to trust me. And this is a mechanism that already exists in industries such as the diamond business, where people who've been in the business for a long time can be trusted because the value of being trusted is high to them and there are mechanisms, though not online mechanisms in that business for confirming who has or has not cheated. You wouldn't want to give somebody with a $10,000 reputation the opportunity for a $100,000 default. So a high value reputation is itself valuable because it means people will trust you more. So the solution to contract enforcement online without government courts is you use arbitrators and digital signatures to make it easy for third parties to know which party broke the contract. You structure your contract so that any risk of breach is on a party with a reputation to lose. If necessary, you rent someone else's reputation or buy and build a reputation for yourself. For more details on that, you can go to my webpage and in particular look at an old uh, article of mine uh, academic contracts in cyberspace, which you can see there.
let's say a little bit more about the downside of strong privacy. What are the reasons this might be a bad thing? I've been generally presenting it as a good thing. Well, one effect which could be good or bad is that you can't tax what you cannot see. So this is going to restrict the ability of governments to collect taxes on things happening online. If I earn my money in cyberspace and spend it in real space, the government can tax my expenditures, my purchases. If I earn my money in real space and spend it in cyberspace, the government can tax my income. But if I earn money in cyberspace and spend it in cyberspace, the government cannot see the transactions and so it cannot collect the taxes. If you think that the world would be a better place if governments had more access to other people's money, then that's a bug. And if you have the opposite opinion, it's a feature. A further problem and a more unambiguously dangerous one is that some kinds of crime become easier in this world. That, uh, for example, one of the main ways in which we now catch kidnappers is by catching them when they collect the money. That's not going to work anymore because they can collect the money as a payment in anonymous digital cash where there is no need for any police department to know where that payment is going to what human being. Uh, so therefore, kidnapping and extortion of various sorts become more workable than they used to be. Furthermore, with a little bit of ingenuity, you could set up a business plan for Murder Incorporated, in which a firm uses this technology to establish two things. One of them is what its public key is, and the other is that it kills people. Uh, there are presumably a fair number of people who have other people they'd like removed. As best I can tell from news stories, the price of that service is less than the price of a new car. And most of us, if we really want to, can afford a car. The reason that it isn't practical to hire somebody to murder your rival in love or professional rival or whatever, or just the person who you hate, is that there's no, at present, no safe way of contacting anybody selling that service. And with this technology, there are ways of solving that problem, unfortunately. So this is not an unambiguously good thing, but it is a change that may happen and that pre creates a very different world, one of whose features is that governments has less control over people for the good or for bad. And there are defenses in the technology as well that they can't extort money from you if they don't know you have money. So if you are earning your money online and spending it online, uh, then there's no reason why any third party should know uh, that you're rich. And in fact, uh, my understanding is that one of the motives for some earlier developments of payment online, the earliest version of PayPal, is that they intended to set it up as a system using personal digital assistants, PDAs, the predecessors of cell phones, uh, for people in third world countries who thought it would be dangerous if either their neighbors or their governor, government knew that they were earning a good deal of money online. And that, for various reasons, didn't work out, and PayPal ended up as being a less exotic plan, but the original plan was indeed associated with these approaches. Uh, similarly, uh, if I am criticizing the government, but I'm doing it as an anonymous online person, there is no way that the government can execute me or arrest me. And in fact, the earliest discussion of this set of issues is a science fiction story by Werner Vinge, uh, in which uh, the it looks like a fantasy because what you're seeing are the online activities, not the real space. But the essential point there is that anonymity is a protection, that as long as nobody knows who you are, they can't do things to you. Uh, which in the story, it sort of is paralleling the fantasy idea that if a, if a sorcerer, a mage, keeps his true name secret, then people can't use magic against him. And the Vinja story is called True Names, and it's about the equivalent of that in an online world where your true name is your, is your real space identity. So all of this suggests that there's going to be a tension between things happening in real space, 
where governments can rule you and assassins can kill you, and what is happening in cyberspace where you use control over information about you in order to protect yourself. What is the world I'm describing look like if we think about both the online and the real space versions of it? In cyberspace, it is stateless. We will develop private legal systems enforced via reputation. You don't want to have to write a 50 page contract for every deal. Just as in the modern world, you want to have a five or 10 page contract and a legal system, which in effect fills in all the blanks from you, for you, except the ones you want to change. And that's going to develop online, as indeed private legal systems have in the past. Uh, Lex Mercantoria is the famous example, merchant law that developed in the fair, fair courts of medieval Europe. Uh, the state, however, still rules real space. So it matters a lot how much of human life is in cyberspace and how much is in real space. And part of what helps me think about this is to remember that I took a trip, I took a trip to India a few years and my daughter who is a freelance online editor came with me. She did the same work she would have done at home when she was in New Delhi and she could stay in touch with the same friends. So that for her in that situation, the minor fact that we were on the other side of the world didn't really affect things very much. If enough people are living those lives, then governments become the equivalent of landlords. They can control the physical land. They can charge you rent for living under their jurisdiction. But if they charge you more rent than you think you ought to pay, you find another government offering better terms. So you then have governments in effect competing for taxpayers. To some extent, they do that already, but they do that a whole lot more if taxpayers are very mobile, which they are in a world where very large parts of life are happening in cyberspace. The final question is not how it can happen, but why it may not happen. First, the world I describe requires a widespread crypto infrastructure. You need a world where essentially everybody has a private key, public key pair, which you can roll up today if you feel like it, and where there are mechanisms for distributing public keys, uh, which I can discuss if people are curious about it, but ways of distributing the public key so that people can be reasonably sure they actually have uh, the public key of a particular real space person if they want to deal in real space and such that anybody who wants to reach you in cyberspace can find your, your public key. Once such a infrastructure exists, it's in people's interests to fit themselves into it, uh, but that's the chicken and the egg problem. I should say one further part of the infrastructure that I didn't mention, but since it looks as though I'm running a couple of minutes uh, under my time limit, I thought I would, is how you keep the government or anybody else from knowing who you're talking to. Uh, and that requires what are called anonymous remailers, which means sites where I send my email to the site, it sends it on, it forwards it to the person I want it forwarded to, but there's a layer of encryption in between. The anonymous remailer has its own public key and private key. I take my message, I encrypt it with the recipient's public key, I encrypt all of that with the remailer's public key, I send it to the remailer, the remailer strips off his level of encryption and sends it on to my, my intended uh, recipient. And if I don't trust the remailer, my intended recipient is really another uh, remailer. And you could imagine in the extreme case where you're really afraid someone is spying on you, that you bounce it through 10 layers of remailers each one stripping off one layer of encryption. And unless all 10 of them are working for the same bad guy, you're safe. So the basic point is that like most worlds, it requires a bunch of people to do things, all of which fit together. Uh, and that may or may not happen. Furthermore, the version of anonymous cash I was thinking about when I wrote the articles I pointed you at, which was the version invented by David Chaum, has one very serious weakness. And that is it requires a bank. It requires a trusted issuer. The issuer holds your money. It gives to you, it to you in a form such that you can make transfers to other people 
where you don't have to know who the other person is, only how to get a message to him. He doesn't have to know who, how, who you are, only how to send you whatever you've bought. And the bank never knows who either of you is. And Chaum figured out a way, a clever way using encryption to do that, but you still have to trust the bank. Trusted banks are in the kind of respectable country where you're reasonably sure they are really doing what they say they're doing. That requires a developed country pretty much, someplace like the US or Germany or the Netherlands. And the governments of those countries don't want anonymous currency because watching money flow is one way in which governments enforce tax laws and drug laws and various other things. To put it differently, once there is a form of anonymous e-cash, now money laundering laws become unenforceable and the government has just lost a sizable source of both revenue and control. So that was the weakness of Chaumian digital cash and the reason that it never came into existence, even though the math was worked out, I would guess maybe by now 40 years ago, something like that. There may be a solution. And the solution is maybe cryptocurrency. The beauty of Bitcoin is that no issuer, issuer is required. There is no bank. Just, just mathematics, uh, just code. On the other hand, the weakness of Bitcoin is that it is the least anonymous currency that has ever been issued because every transaction in Bitcoin is public information to everybody using Bitcoin. Now that's a slight overstatement because the public information is not between people, but between accounts. So you can maintain some level of privacy by keeping as secret as you can the link between your real space identity and the Bitcoin uh, account that you are using to hold your money. But somebody who watches carefully can probably break that anonymity. He can make a payment to you knowing your real space identity, observe what account that goes to. So you have to do various fancy things to prevent that. On the other hand, there are at least two projects that I know of, and so there may be other people here who know of others, to try to develop uh, cryptocurrencies that are more nearly anonymous. I say more nearly anonymous because I had a session at a conference uh, maybe a couple of years ago on this subject, and there were people there from both of the projects, and both of them agreed that they couldn't make their cryptocurrency perfectly anonymous. That is to say, a bad guy willing to spend enough resources watching you long enough to try to deduce from transactions who you are could eventually do it. However, they can make it very hard. And if it's hard enough, that's about what you can hope for. That in general, when I talk about what you can or can't do with encryption, there's always the implicit assumption of some limit to resources. So that I said earlier that the key that encrypts things can't decrypt it. If you had infinite time, you have an encrypted message, you have the public key, you just write out all possible messages that long, encrypt all of them with the public key and look to see which one matches. Of course, if you wanna do that, you probably should provide a good supply of candles because the sun will have burned out by the time you finish uh, making every possible copy of a 10,000 character message. I'll let you work out the arithmetic for yourself, encrypting it and checking. So it's really, all of this is really saying this works as long as the opponent has less than some amount of resources. Governments have a lot of resources, but they also have a lot of people they want to watch, which means that those resources get divided up. Uh, so all of these are reasons why it might not happen. I don't want to claim to be a prophet. I have a book, Future Imperfect, which discusses this technology and many others. And one of the lessons of that book is that the future is radically uncertain. We don't really know. What I'm trying to do is to sketch out one possible future that you and even I may live in. Thank you. I think I'm back now. Can I unshare my screen? 
Let's try that. Yes, I've unshared my screen. What happens now? Do people ask me questions and I get to talk to them? Well, it seems that we are full with technical difficulties uh, right here. Uh, first, you can join now. We can't. But David, uh, do you hear me now again? Fantastic. This was a this was a very very. I can great hear talk. you. As usual, uh, your rational mind is is beautiful to follow. Um, it's very well done. So thank you. We do have a couple very nice, interesting questions in the chat here. Um, the first by by Colin Kirby. Reputation-based uh, transactional systems work with strong privacy implemented by default okay the by default part important if i do not wish to reveal that i have ever enga in, engaged in a contract with someone and desired to keep all of my business private how would i build a reputation in the very first place but the answer is that in this system the person who you want to contract with will only contract with you if you are willing to digitally sign a contract specifying an arbitrator that you can't, you know, can't sign a contract all by yourself, or at least there's no point to doing it. So the condition, in the, obviously I'm describing, I'm sketching sort of a simple version of how the system works. And I could imagine that in the real world, you would both have less rigorous versions, which we already have, that eBay and Amazon both use reputational systems of a less, uh, elegant, less, less mathematical version that I'm describing, but they work pretty well. Uh, but once this is developed, there will doubtless be fancier versions. But in what I'm in, in the simple world that I'm describing, people who don't trust you already are only willing to sign a, to, to do business with you if you agree to digitally sign a contract specifying an arbitrator. Once you've done that, uh, however strong your privacy, uh, if you want people to do business with you, you've got to have some way for them to find you. So you've got to have an online identity, even if you keep your real space identity secret. And once you've got an online identity, uh, people can link to that online identity to point other people who want to do business with you at the contract. Yes, I you think it's, it's very difficult so uh, to, to get in a truly anonymous system uh, a reputation or uh, to get this reputation without relying on a trusted third party. Right. Uh, but of course, trusted third parties are security holds, uh, which is, uh, I think, a very, very fundamental problem that ought to be solved. Uh, and to speak of, of one potential solution specifically uh, in the Bitcoin ecosystem, and that is when one side of the trade um, is is actually um, uh, uh, like a Bitcoin Bitcoin asset where we have strong private property contracts enforced in the script itself, right? It never leaves cyberspace. Um, it is it is uh, defined and enforced by the nodes. Um, but the problem the problem with that, as I understand it, is that you then need some way in which the software can observe what happens. This is the Oracle problem, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and there are some ingenious. Uh, solutions which may or may not work to those but on the whole i think probably you are better off using human beings as things now exist than trying to write smart i know smart contracts are a very old idea i remember seeing discussions of those probably 30 years ago uh, and it may be it may prove workable in some cases but you have to have some way that the uh, software is sort of sophisticated enough to actually observe what the terms of the contract are, what they, and, and if you if you if you try to think about real world contracts, it's hard to think of ones which are so unambiguous. You know, did I deliver what I said I would deliver? Well, I delivered a program that would do X. How do we decide whether it does X? And that's going to be hard to hard to build in. Uh, so I I still think that trusted third parties, given that you've got a whole world full of third parties to yeah, choose that's... among, there are going to be some you can trust. I think. But no system is perfect. I don't want to overstate this. I only, but then of course our present system isn't perfect either. That aside from all the problems with the government's doing bad things, uh, a court makes mistakes necessarily because the court is human too. Uh, there are things which even if the court doesn't make mistakes, it can't observe in order to know what's happened. So it seems to me that on the whole, and this has the virtue that whereas the courts is not, is mostly not a competitive system, 
I don't have a choice of which court's law. I have some choice of which court's law to do things under. If I form a corporation, I can form it in Delaware if I think they have better corporation law. But to a large extent in our present system, I'm stuck with a monopoly court system. It's not clear that monopoly court system has an incentive to, to do a good job. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, in this system, my arbitrators are in the business of being arbitrators. They want the reputation not only of being honest, but of being competent. Uh, and not only of being competent, but of having legal rules that people want to have their, their contract judged under. So this is really creating a competitive market for legal services. And I, in my first book, uh, which was published about 71 or so, so that's God, almost 50 years old now, uh, I sketched a real space version of that where you had institutions that gave you private courts in effect competing for business in a market context where they wanted to create the kind of law people wanted to live under. And this, it seems to me, that's may happen at some point in the future, but not in my lifetime unless they solve the aging problem fairly quickly. Uh, but uh, but I think that could pretty easily happen online. And I yes, yes, I, I really do believe so. And for example, a BISC, B I S Q is a, is a decentralized marketplace um, where individuals can open up offers uh, to buy or sell Bitcoin for whatever good or service. Most of them are cryptocurrencies, uh, but different fiat payments as well. Um, and this uses also an arbitration model in a two of three multi-signature. Um, and this is a very successful project, I would say, uh, because for mm. a, a, a very long time, uh, this was, uh, there was no occurrence of theft at all uh, on the platform for multiple years. Um, then there was one bug, uh, unfortunately, being exploited by a malicious uh, actor. Um, the bug was fixed. Uh, so unfortunately, the, the stellar record is, is no longer there, but it's a very successful project. Um, I, I would like to, to shift to one more uh, interesting yep. topic, and that is that you brought up these digital e-cash banks. And one of the main issues is that it's one trusted third party right, who could increase the, the token supply at will. Um, now, last year at the Hackers Congress, uh, Frank Brown and Smuggler revealed a new technology called Scrit. Uh, S-C-R-I-T, uh, and this enables to have a fully anonymous digital cash system that relies not on one, but on a federation of M of N trusted third parties uh, to, uh, to secure the spent book. Uh, what are your thoughts on distributing this trust from one person to a federation? Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't looked at that. I do, I do have a, a, a system that I thought up and described in my blog probably a couple of years ago. And that was for solving the specific problem of trying to have an e-cash which had a fixed value in terms of, uh, of existing money. So it would be convenient for some purposes to have an e-cash which was always one for one with dollars, say, or between 99 cents and a dollar and one cent, say. And then I sketched out how you would do that where you have a group of issuers, uh, say 10 people, organizations, whatever they are, each identified by its public key. And what an, it, being an issuer means is that if the value of the currency goes above $1, someone is allowed to issue one more unit. And it goes around the ring. The next person in line gets to issue one unit until the price gets down to a dollar. If it gets below a dollar, the next person in line is obligated to burn one unit, to pull in one unit and destroy it. That costs him something. But the reason he does that is if he fails, he's out of the ring. He's no longer has the right to create units. So as long as your expectation is that the value is going to push up on average, not down, it pays the issuers to do this. I can sell the right to be an issuer to somebody else because all I have to do is to give him my private key, uh, my old private key. I'll roll up a new one for other purposes at that point. Uh, so, so that was a scheme I thought up because at the moment, uh, Bitcoin is not very convenient for sort of casual currency uses because its value fluctuates. The fact its value fluctuates doesn't matter very much in terms of gaining or losing money. If you only have $100 worth of Bitcoin, it's a small part of your assets, but it's a nuisance if you're trying to calculate prices. Uh, and therefore, it would be useful to have a cryptocurrency set up to be a one-to-one -one for a dollar or a euro or whatever the currencies are people use. Uh, so that's why I thought of that scheme. And that's vaguely similar to what you're describing in that there are a group of issuers uh, and you only, in a sense, you only have to trust at least one of them in the sense that all they can do 
is issue if the price is above and what the price you then have to have a an oracle which will tell you what the price of your coin is so you would have to have the software have some trusted observation of exchange rates and you could probably figure out some fairly straightforward way of doing that but yeah no this whole world is an interesting world and i have not really tried to keep track of all the things people are doing in it that i'm ultimately a theorist not an empiricist uh, that the real world is very complicated and i like simple things uh so i try to think figure out the logic of it and then look at bits and pieces but in terms of what's happening in the ordinary parts of real space as you probably know ebay indeed has set up reputational mechanisms not fancy ones like i described but ones where anytime you buy from ebay you get to report on the seller and then other people who want to buy from that seller see that report uh, amazon of course has reviews and one of the interesting things I discovered, the obvious problem with Amazon reviews is that you can fake them, that you can uh, buy a copy of your own product and then give it a good review. But there is also software for spotting fake reviews, as I discovered a while ago. There's a website and they at least have algorithms which try to recognize the characteristics. And I usually do it by hand. That is, you read a review and you say, how likely is it? that this review was not really written by a human being telling the truth. And that's, in general, one of the nice things about the web, in my opinion, is that because it's an obviously unfiltered medium, it encourages people to figure out how to tell who to believe on internal evidence. That if you're not brain dead, you know that the fact that something is on the web doesn't mean it's true. And then you try to develop other mechanisms for figuring out what is true. And that is a very important skill in lots of places other than the web that that you want to know when does it sound as though this person is trying to put one over on you uh, when does it sound as though he's making an honest argument doing the best he can to give the arguments against his position as well as for his position so the extreme in the other direction was the debate last uh, it, what, the night last night or the night before last between two pres presidential candidates where it was pretty obvious after the first three minutes that neither of them could be trusted that they're both uh, demagogues saying whatever they think will work and you can choose your taste in demagogues but but online there are people who can be trusted and people yes, who can't that's very be trusted good point. and you need to um, maybe to finish it up with with one question that i think is very present uh, as well and that is how to make a secure transition from meat space to cyberspace right so how do we choose secure dwelling places uh, and how do we protect physical locations uh, specifically ensuring travel in between these physical locations um, uh, in a sign in a time where we have a lot of censorship of, of free movement uh, uh, on currently. I'm not sure I understand how you can do that, how that's possible. That is to say, the, the, the state still controls real space. So there is no way that you, if a government says, we will not allow you into our country unless you show your passport and let us photograph your face, there's no way you can stop them from doing that as far as I can tell. You can get into their country online. That is to say, you can deal with people in their country from somewhere else, but your physical body is something that they can observe. And in fact, one of the things I discuss in, in my book, Future Imperfect, is the tension between surveillance and encryption. The fact that surveillance technology plus face recognition plus databases gives the possibility of a world where everything that happens in real space is recorded and findable. So you could at the same time have a world which was strong privacy in real space and David Brin's transparent society, sorry, strong privacy in cyberspace, David Brin's transparent society in real space. And you can then think of ways in which each of them could try to affect the other. That the real space people can watch you typing on your keyboard to try to break your encryption. The cyberspace people could do their conversations even in real space <laughs> via Bluetooth communication with encrypted uh, voices and so forth. So it's an interesting to try to think about, probably more fun for a science fiction writer, uh, for Vinja or Bryn than uh, for me. Uh, I've written some fantasy, but nothing that's really science fiction, uh, but also interesting to speculate. So if, if you, people, I should say most of my book, many of my books, probably most of my books are available online to be read for free from my webpage, although it's, there's usually a cleaner, better, easier to read version that you can pay for. They're not very expensive as as uh, Kindles or as, as printed books. Uh, 
my latest project, which I'd love to do with any of this, is that my second novel has just been recorded and is going to be available as an audio book very shortly. It's called Salamander, and I think the guy who recorded it did a really good job. So well, let me that's, put in that's one a very plug great for plug. that. Um, you know, do let's do one more quick final question, uh, already talking about speculation. Of course, uh, you've speculated quite a lot uh, in, in your writings early, uh, and it turns out that you're pretty spot on in many cases, uh, probably because of strong first principles uh, and a beautiful rational mind. Uh, so how do you elaborate further? Uh, let, let's talk about the next uh, one, two generations. Where do you think technology uh, helping or uh, liberating individuals? <clears throat> Almost certainly both, just as in the past. That on the one hand, uh, I think the developments I was talking about in this talk are going to liberate individuals. Uh, in some ways, unrelated technologies already liberated individuals. The very fact that I have better access to information today sitting at my desk than I would have sitting in the Library of Congress 50 years ago. That uh, what I write books. I'm currently in the process of converting 15 years of blog posts into probably two or three books, I would guess. In doing that, there are facts I've got to look up. Uh, I see a reference to something. It used to be that checking that reference and figuring out what it was would be required me to go to a library and probably spend a couple of hours searching stuff. Now I can do it in 10 minutes uh, on Wikipedia and Google and all of those things. So that such uh, stuff has liberated people in a non-political sense very, very, very largely. Uh, you know, there. I used to say that I, I wrote my second book uh, using a word processor, a very early word processor on a super clone of the TRS-80, for those old enough to remember that machine, LNW-80, nice machine. Uh, and after I finished writing that book, I concluded that prior to the invention of the word processor, no books were written, it's just too much work. Uh, and so there are a bunch of things which are easy now and used to be hard. So those technologies are liberating us for reasons that have little to do with politics. At the same time, some of the things that governments want to do also are easy that used to be hard. So that I, I have a discussion also in that book that if you think about wiretaps, it used to be that the real limitation to wiretaps was not the courts, it was the money. It was the fact that in order to operate a wiretap, you have to have a human being listening to the phone for hundreds of hours. You have to do that for many, many people. And once in a while, you'll find what you're looking for. That problem has been solved. We've got uh, speech to text software friend of mine helped develop it, uh, worked for Dragon Dictate a long time ago. Uh, and with speech to text software, you can have a computer listen to the phone. The computer can then analyze it looking for keywords, and it only turns it over to a human being when it finds them. Computers work fast and cheap. I did some calculations years ago. I'm sure it would be cheaper now. And I concluded that you could be tapping every phone in the US for a capital investment of a few billion dollars worth of computer hardware and probably cheaper now, I'm not sure. But, and that was at, at a time when it looked as though the FBI wanted, they didn't put it that way, but they wanted technology that would let them tap huge numbers of phones at once. And uh, this was a digital wiretap bill again, decades ago, but these issues aren't gonna go away. Uh, so, so on the one hand, the technology empowers people, but some of those people are good people and some of them are bad people and some of them are in between. Some of them are people who think they're doing good things, but I may disagree. I mean, I assume that the FBI, most FBI agents are not people who think they're doing evil. Nonetheless, I would let, rather live in a world where the government can't easily know what other people are doing because it quite often wants to know for bad reasons. So. So I don't think there's a simple answer to your question. Is the general question, is the world getting better or worse? And the answer is always yes. Uh, that China has gotten enormously better, uh, not as much better as it should have. It's still a dictatorship, but it's now a more or less capitalist dictatorship, uh, uh, like what Spain or Portugal was, say, under their dictators. And that's a great improvement over a communist dictatorship because under the communist dictatorship, people were starving to death in very large numbers and people were very poor. Uh, so that's the respect in which the world got a lot better in our lifetime. It's, I think the changes from Mao's death uh, for the next 20 years or so may be the largest increase in human welfare that's ever happened in that short a period of time. 
Uh, the, but the, at the same the time, is always eating itself too. up, uh, so, ever expanding and, yeah. and devouring so the world itself. Is never so uh, David, this was a phenomenal talk. Thank you uh -huh. very much for this after conversation as well. Uh, again, yes. a, a beautiful display of, of some nice reasoning and logic. Uh, I treasured that very much. Uh, so thank you again for coming on to the Hackers Congress uh, and hopefully see you next year again. Thank you very much. <laughs>